Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. I would never have thought it true. Hmm? Thought what, George? that we too would be sitting in this spacious glass house in the middle of a large park watching the rain teeming down and drinking water. <laughs> All this stuff is good for our livers, George. Years of misuse. That's your diagnosis, remember. Vichy. No doctor sent me here. I'm perfectly well, fit as a fiddle. Well, we both came of our own free wills. You must give it time. And in a few days, you'll feel a different person. I already feel very different, believe me. Unwell and foul-tempered. <laughs> you must accept your situation, Georges, and drink up. <sighs> when I first came here over ten years ago... Yes, I know. You were far from well, and a doctor sent you. <laughs> Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon in Maigret Takes the Waters, translated by Eileen Ellenbogen and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradman. Oh, it wasn't any doctor, you know. It was my old friend Pardon. Louise and I were dining with the Pardons when I, well, to be honest, almost fainted. Without reason. Overwork, not enough sleep, too much drink. Probably a bit of each. No, oh, it was June. Paris was sweltering. I was just turned 50 and felt 90. Pardon examined me immediately after dinner. There was nothing seriously wrong. And he suggested the cure at Vichy? Mm, for three weeks, under the care of our friend Dr. Rian. And you didn't try to wriggle out of it, find excuses? No, Georges. Like you, I accepted my fate. You mean you were Shanghai? <laughs> well, for my own good. Within a week that June, I found myself sitting in this park Louise by my side, watching the people come and go. Now, one evening in particular, the municipal band playing and the shadows lengthening across the green. Oh, do you realize, you? it's been five days. Mm, I feel as if I've lived here all my life, Louise. Oh, Vish is that sort of a place, a kind of second home. There she is again. Ah. A lady in lilac. And she's got her white shawl on, I see. I wonder, is she a widow? No, I don't think so. That face is an old maid's face. What age is she? Forty? Fifty? Hmm? Hard to tell. You think she's deaf? Deaf? Why? Yes, she could be. I mean, she doesn't seem to see or hear anything. Well, not the music, certainly. On the other hand, she doesn't move with that carefulness I've noticed in the deaf. She should be in a nun's habit, don't you think? Well, I'd say she likes her own company, likes solitude. She comes here every year, or, or twice a year. Oh, no, I don't think she's a visitor. She belongs. This is her town. What a way for us to go on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think other people are doing the same about us? Well, so long as nobody recognises me, I don't mind. Would you like a little stroll? No, I, I'd sooner sit here and have a pipe. You go if you want to. I'd like to. Mm. Just for five minutes. All right. You're going to be all right, Shul. Thought you were at the beginning of the end, didn't you, damned idiot? What did Dr. Vignon say? E.R.S. Perfect. Cholesterol a little on the high side. Nothing we can't deal with. No need to worry about uric acid. Blood count could scarcely be better. Treatment? I want you to alternate between two springs, Chamel and Grand Gris. I've written down what you should take and your diet. There's nothing wrong with you, but a thorough clean-out won't cure. Ah, there goes our lady of the lilacs. Nobody in the world but her. And there's Louise. We pass each other. 
Louis smiles. Lilac Lady doesn't register. <laughs> that walk so prim and so infallible, never a foot wrong. I smiled at him. Mm. Did you see? Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> and you have a lovely smile, Louise. But she wouldn't be able to tell, would she? I suppose she must know somebody here. We should have her followed, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a lovely evening. You're not finding it too awful, you? Awful? No, that's the last thing. No, it's another world. I enjoy the strangeness of it. And something else, you know, this summer in Paris, I had the feeling that everybody I knew was younger. Oh. Or that I was older than everybody, even old you, Carl. Terrible. Now I'm already beginning to feel quite a young 50-year-old, and that's something. <laughs> now, come on, my girl, let's have a brisk walk back to the hotel. We're staying at that same hotel, I take it, Jules. No, oh, where else could we stay? It hasn't changed. Go on, you have my interest. The lady in lilac. Mm, well, Louise and I had gotten, as our Yankee friends say, into a steady routine. Louise insisted on taking the cure also. Two glasses of the Gria Spring in the morning, walks, a light diet, two glasses here at the Chamel in the late afternoon. And never a glass of wine? No, naturally not. And we watched our fellow cure takers and wondered about them. And, of course, the lady in lilac still teased us. We always noticed her. We even noticed that she didn't appear one evening in the park, not to listen to the band. And you then discovered that she was the best con woman in that part of France? Oh, you've a point there, George. I've never considered. <laughs> Do you know I actually like this stuff? Keep to the lady in lilac, please. We didn't get up all that early, and I'd sit around in my pyjamas, drinking coffee, eating croissant, reading the local papers, and the Daily Journal de clermont Ferrand. Now, the morning after Our Lady of the Solitudes had not visited the park in the evening... Hmm. Good grief. <laughs> I'll be damned. Uh, Louise? I'm feeling a teeth. On the front page, a picture of the lady in lilac. Ooh, what's she done, Jules? Allowed herself to be murdered. Murdered? Let me see. Well, she lived near here, the Rue du Bourbonnet. Well, she did live in Vichy, as I thought. Owned her house, let furnished rooms on the first floor. Says she was strangled. How horrible. Mm. The poor woman. Well, who would do that? To her? What, what, was it a, a sex thing? Well, they say not. The place was ransacked. Nothing seems to have been taken. There was money and jewels in one drawer. Uh, two of her lodgers found her yesterday morning in her sitting room. Who's in charge of the case? Oh, how should I know? You mean that you don't want to know? Hmm? No, it says here something about the super in charge of the Department of Criminal Investigations being one Lequeur. Ah, uh, probably the liqueur was with me in Paris at one time. Will you be paying him a visit? I never understand, Jules, how you find your way through the back streets to where you want to go. And you don't even know these streets. Well, it's a policeman's sense of direction. Is it really? And you're always complaining that young Plant could become lost in his own back garden. <laughs> <laughs> where are we now? The Rue du Bourbonnet. The dead woman's house? Across there. Ah. What's it called? Can you see? Just. The irises. There's a milkman trying to deliver the milk. Oh, he had his order and until it's cancelled. The irises, isn't it? Not the lilacs. A pretty house. Chief Inspector Maybe. Yes? Sir, Division Inspector Lacour sends his compliments and asks you to join him at the scene of the crime. Ah. Where shall I wait for you, Jules? Well, the usual place at the spring. I won't be long. All right, young man, leave off. Did you know I was here in Vichy? Uh, the Vichy police picked up your name on the hotel registration form, and of course they've seen you around in general with Madame Maigret. I do hope she's well. Oh, she's fine and waiting for me. <laughs> I'm the one here for the cure. Yes, I guess so, Chief. But I wondered if you'd be interested. It's not a run-of-the-mill murder. Nor is there such a thing. All right, Lequeur, my old friend. Who was she? Hélène Lange. Unmarried, 47, born at Marseille, near La Rochelle. 
Mother and father dead, but I've discovered she had a younger sister, Francine Lange, unmarried, owns a hairdressing establishment in La Rochelle. She's been in Mallorca on holiday. I got hold of her, and she's on her way here. Mm. Uh, this this room, the dead woman's parlour, I take it. Mm, yes, chief. The photographs are of her. Yes, I see. Hmm. Only of her. Not a single shot of anybody else. She alone. Yes, I hadn't noticed. It is odd. Mm. What do you know about the murder? Well, not very much. The night before last, Helen Lange had supper alone, two boiled eggs, washed up and went out. She was wearing a lilac-coloured dress. And over it a white shawl. <laughs> yes, that's so. How do you know, Chief? Oh, well, my wife and I saw her sitting in the Chamel Park the night before last, about 9.30. She was alone. Well, she was always alone. That sounds as if you knew her. Well, Louise and I had noticed her, the Lady in Lilac, we called her. A very solitary lady, and I suspect rather out of the ordinary. She had a way of walking as if there wasn't a soul within ten metres of her. Mm. Yeah, but do go on, Le Coeur, it's your case. Well, there's a couple from Grenoble who have one bedroom on the first floor, the uh, Maleskis. Uh, Madame Virvo has the other. She's sixty-odd and very self-important, a duchess in disguise. Well, the Maleskis are very nice. They stay here every year for a few weeks. Well, the night of the murder, they were at the cinema, got back about uh, 11.30. Hélène Lange's shutters were closed, as usual, but they noticed that the light was on in her living room. Did they hear anything? Well, Maleski not. His wife thought she heard a murmur of voices, but she's not sure. Well, they went to bed and slept undisturbed. The dowager duchess was out playing bridge. She walked home, and she swears that as she came round the corner, she almost bumped into a man hurrying away. Well, he put his hand over his face to avoid being recognised, according to our witness, and was very tall and powerfully built with a chest like a gorilla. Mm, what do you think? Well, she, she knew about the murder when I spoke to her. She could have a vivid imagination, but... Uh, no, I don't think she invented the man. Endowed a hurrying home passerby with a dramatic quality. Eh? Mm. Still, stranger chances have occurred. And when she arrived at the irises... Well, all the lights were out and there wasn't a sound. Madame Virvo went to bed in a state of shock. One doesn't bump into a giant rushing away from the scene of the crime every day, does one, Chief? No. Who found the body? Well, the Maleskis called the police when they found the dead woman's room shut up and not a sound. And they had to break in. The key to the living room door was missing. The other rooms were locked from the inside. They found her in this room. You've, uh, you've read the newspaper reports, I take it? Yes. Strangled. Not touched otherwise. Mm. Nothing taken in the house, but everything turned upside down. I wonder what he was looking for. She lived here for long? Yeah, nine years. She bought the house then. I've been in touch with a lawyer. She paid for the place with cash, a small suitcase of notes. He's never known it happened before or since. Did you have a bank account? No, I mean, not then. Yes, with the Quedi Lyonnais. A young de has just got back from there. Come and tell the chief what you found out, Dissel. Yes, Inspector. Shall I come in? <laughs> well, it would save us straining our ears. Yes. She was worth just over 500,000 francs, Chief. Mm, she was a rich woman. Rich and single. Tell me, Dissel, did she pay money into her account regularly? Well, Chief, not on a set day. But she paid in a basic 5,000 francs a month, the manager told me. And during the season, when there was money coming in from her lodgers, a few thousand more some months. The 5,000 francs, was that in cash? In cash, Chief. Mm. OK, thank you, Dissel. Thank you, my boy. As always in cash. The postman tells me she received very little post. Nothing, really, except circulars and bills. Thank you, Chief. And the neighbours say she never had a visitor. Oh, well, they'd know, wouldn't they, in a street like this? Well, the Maleskis have stayed here for a few years now, but as they say, they know nothing of her. They've only ever been in this room, her part of the house, once for two minutes. Mm, it adds up. Solitary and secretive, Liqueur. Mm. And who killed such a woman, and why? And who gave her the money? Did she ever leave, Vichy? Yes, yes, she did, so it seems, for a day or two at a time each month. Once again, at different times. Do you know how she travelled? No, not for sure. But the couple next door say she was collected by a taxi, so it'll be easy enough to find out. If she went by train, I think it'll be worth your time to find out where she went. And when she got back, did she pay money into the bank? Mm. Yes, I'll do that, Chief. Could it be blackmail, do you think? 
Perhaps she was paid to be solitary and silent. Now, I must be on my way. I'm late for my first class as it is. Hmm. I waited for you to arrive, Jules, before I took my first class. Didn't seem right without you. Hmm. After all, it is your cure. <laughs> it is my cure, but thank heavens it isn't my case. Is it difficult? Probably unsolvable. Oh. The sister should help when she arrives. What I ask myself is, why did she come to Vichy? But why not to Vichy? Well, why not the town near her home village, La Rochelle? Her sister is there. Why Vichy? Well, you one can quite easily get lost in the crowd here. Mm, yes, you're right. It's obvious if you come to think of it. Now, this town virtually changes its population about every three weeks. In any other town of this size, she would be known, certainly after all the years she's been here, by all and their uncles. But here... One would take her for just another visitor. Mm. Her neighbours, it seems, know little about her. But her neighbours will be busy finding out about their guests, talking about the latest batch of visitors. Mm. Well, that's the first class. We'd better have our second. We must have our second, or you must. Mm. Did you know the Vichy police are watching my every move? I can't see anybody in here who remotely resembles a policeman. <laughs> the water comes out looking incredibly clear, doesn't it? I think the inhabitants of Vichy ever drink it. And what about the police? Oh, I reckon they prefer their beer. <laughs> now, come and sit down. I have a few more questions. <clears throat> it's nice you being on holiday so that you can talk about a case. Well, it doesn't happen to be my case. No, dear, of course it isn't. Now, why that night in particular? The night she was killed, you mean? Yes. Why that night? Why not the night before or the month before? Because the murderer seized his chance, perhaps? Hmm. She was solitary, she had a lonely routine. Nobody seems ever to have visited her. And she never visited a soul in the town. So to murder her on any night would, on the face of it, be quite simple. That is, if a local man was the murderer. But what sort of reason would he have for strangling her? And what was he looking for? And why that night in particular? Perhaps it was somebody only in Vichy on mm. that night. A visitor. Mm. Good. I see it, see it like this. Since we've been here, we've been noticing the same people two or three times a day in this place, in the parks, where the band plays, and so on. That's true. Some of them I feel I've known for years by sight. Mm, good. Now, this is our first visit. It'll probably be our last. But, Louise, if we were to come back next year at the same time, we'd probably recognise quite a few faces from this first visit, including the lady in lilac, if she hadn't met her with her death. Well, that's true, too, Jules. What are you trying to say? That there's somebody else in Vichy for the first time, like ourselves, going through the same routine, going to the same places. And like us, he must have seen Elaine Lange once or twice. And he recognised her, you mean? He hadn't seen her for years. Hmm. It took time, maybe, until he was sure, but there was something he wanted to talk to her about, something from the past. You said her sister's expected. She'd know about the poor woman's past, wouldn't she? Oh, some of it, anyway. Of course, one can narrow down the suspects in Vichy at this time to a few hundred. Can one? I'm not going to guess, you. <laughs> well, according to the official brochure, people pour in for the cure at the rate of 30,000 a month at this time of the year. And about a third of them are here for the first time. 10,000? Hmm. And you? Of that 10,000, there must be over half that are women. Could a woman have strangled her? No, it was a strong man. Right, 5,000 men. Now, I'd say, from what I've seen these last days, that at least 75% of the men here are too old or too feeble or too sick to strangle a sparrow. So that leaves us with... Um, 12. 1,250. Hmm. Well, that's still an awful lot, Jules. <laughs> I'll tell poor Lequeur. 1,250 suspects. So all he has to do is to eliminate those with foolproof alibis, and the rest is easy. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's probably thinking the same way himself. 
her sister may help, but not if she's like the dead woman, that's for sure. Well, yeah. Mm. Have you drunk up? Yes. Time for our walk back to the hotel. A light lunch, and you will have your afternoon nap. Oh, I don't actually sleep, you know. I only relax and doze a bit. If I said Jules he were asleep and snoring, he'd say I made it up. Now who can help me? Yes. Ah, oh, Madame Maybray. Uh, I'm Inspector Lecour. Is uh... Uh, yes. See for yourself. Oh, uh, I, I was passing. I need advice. Le I I'm sorry. I'll come back. I think it would be as well. He is here to rest, Monsieur. Oh. Uh, 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 uh. <sighs> What's going on? Inspector Lecour has called you, but he'll come back later. I, I was just passing the hotel, Chief. Oh, well, well do come in. Do shut the door, please. Well, what's happened? You do have a chair, Inspector. Mm, fell sound asleep. Oh, got a problem, have you? Well, in a way, yes, or rather, it, it could be a problem. Mm, ah, you found the murderer, and it's turned out to be the mayor. <laughs> if you knew our mayor, I'd happily arrest him. Mm. No, it's, uh, it's the sister, Francine Lange. She's here, and uh, she's identified the body, and now I'm on my way to talk to her. You see, she's quite a handful. Mm, does she like her dead sister? Doesn't open her mouth? Well, with Madame Maigret here, it's hard for me to speak my mind. Oh, monsieur. My husband and I have discussed every single type of human being at one time or another. I'm immune to shock. Thank you, madame. Well, she's as unlike her sister as a woman can be. I, I suppose she must be 40, but she looks younger. She's blonde and with one hell of a figure. And she's wearing a sort of see-through dress, and she's not wearing a bra. Mm. She's not married. She told me she knew too much about my sex to marry any of us. I take it you're sure she is the sister. Oh, yes, 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 quite sure. You see, I thought, Chief, that with you in the room, life would be easier. I mean, she's decided that she can treat me as she treats all her men, I imagine. Then you think she's likely to treat me differently? Well, I think you'd know how to treat her differently. Um, you are Maigret from Paris. <laughs> there, you see, Louise, the reputation I have with the ladies. And those who are not ladies also. Ah, well, to the non-lady then, Lecoeur. <laughs> uh, Louise, I'll see you at the park at five o'clock. If you're through with Francine, by five. I've never been in my sister's house, you know. Yes, so you were saying, mademoiselle. And this is where she didn't entertain the gentleman friends she didn't have. The old maid's parlour. She entertained one gentleman recently, mademoiselle. <laughs> one too many. Do you think I killed my sister? She was brutally strangled, although she fought hard against her attacker. Yes, yes, she would. Have you any idea? We've no idea who it was, no idea why it happened. Uh, will you tell us what you know about your sister? When did you last see her, for instance? Mm, six years ago. She came to La Rochelle, turned up out of the blue. Now, tell me what you know of your sister's background, Francie, as a young woman. She went to secretarial college in La Rochelle, then she worked there. Then, when she was about 23, she went to Paris and worked as a secretary. I followed her there a few years later. Mm, do you remember where she lived in Paris? Oh, yes. Well... She had a very nice flat in the Rue Notre Dame de Lorette. She must have been earning well. Or somebody was paying for it. <laughs> if they were, they weren't getting value for their money. I've liked men. I still do. Alain, never. I don't think there was ever a man in her life. And yet I take it you got on well enough? When we saw each other, yes. I turned to her once and... She was a real sister that time. You were in trouble in Paris? Fifteen years ago. I had a child, a boy. Elaine found foster parents for him on a farm in the Vosges. We both used to go and see him. He was nearly three when he drowned in a pond. It seems, mademoiselle, that your sister led a very lonely life. Ever since she was a girl, she was happiest on her own. It could be maddening. She had such a very good opinion of herself, a sort of being self-satisfied. Self-satisfied? Well, she looks it in all these photographs of herself, don't you think? Uh, somebody took them, mademoiselle. I wish I knew who. <laughs> well, I took that one. A boyfriend of mine took that. The others? 
Probably she stopped somebody and asked them to hold the camera. If it was what she wanted, she wouldn't hesitate, believe me. Now, presumably, Mademoiselle, you've no idea how your sister lived. I know she owned this house. I imagined always she lived by letting rooms. Well, you'll be surprised. She to... left no will, it seems, Mademoiselle. You were therefore her sole heir. Yes. Yes, I would be. Let me know, will you, when I can bury her? The sooner I can get away from this dump, the better. So you stopped Lecoeur from saying you will be surprised to know that she died a rich woman. Yes. I explained to him afterwards. Well, not that I could really explain, Georges. I felt only that this forthright sister wasn't perhaps as forthright as she might be. And the less she knew what you knew, the better. Mm. That is simply, Georges, if she knew about the 5,000 francs a month and discovered that we knew... She could try to obliterate the source. Did you think that the sisters had been in something together? Well, they were together in Paris. Elaine, up until 15 years ago, Francine more recently. There was a gap in Elaine's life, by the way, between Paris and Vichy. But in Paris, she had a nice flat in a smart district, on a secretary's salary. Oh, never. Perhaps the answer lies in the past. Find out about Paris and you begin to put the thing together. Mm. Well, we were lucky, or Lecoeur was. The police found that the concierge where Elaine once had her flat was still there. And she recalled that Elaine had a gentleman caller. He was then, she thought, about 40, heavily built, expensive clothes, well-groomed, and drove a large black American car. He called a couple of times a week, left around midnight. And they sometimes went off at weekends. This for about four years. And then Elaine suddenly left. She would have been 32 when she left Paris. Fifteen years ago, when Francine had her boy child. Hmm. Lecoeur still had a lot of work to do. <laughs> Louise was becoming somewhat sardonic about my cure, suggesting that perhaps I should go back to Paris as it would be more restful. And the papers were having quite a time. And look at this picture of you. Hmm? Maigret takes the waters. You look as if you've taken more than just water. Well, let me see. No. <laughs> yes. Well, I haven't had a drink for weeks. We should leave for our afternoon drink of water in half an hour. Hmm. So that is Francine Lange. I do see what you mean. Hmm? Uh, Mademoiselle Francine, whose sister was recently... <laughs> The girl should have seen to it that she wasn't mentioned in the press. Why? Because she looks like a tart? No, Louise, because the murder is still in Vichy, in all probability. And if Francie knows more than she pretends to know... Yes, I never thought. The man's still about. She could be in danger. Well, she should have thought. Mm, she didn't. Now, come in. Ah, Diesel, come in and shut the door. Thank you, Chief. Inspector Lequeur asked me to let you know the places that the dead woman visited over the last year. Oh, good. Far away. Oh, but before you do, I'll leave you. I'm just going down to the chemist, and, and when I get back, monsieur, we must leave for the spring. Very well, madame. <laughs> well, now, how did she travel? By train. Mm. The station booking chaps can't remember all the names, but some places stuck in their minds. Strasbourg, Brest, Dieppe, Carcassonne, which meant changing trains three times... Lyon was about the nearest town. Paris? Never Paris. The last trip the clerks remember was on the day of some big horse race, June the 11th, to Reims. And has the inspector checked with the bank account? Mademoiselle Lange paid 5,000 francs into her account on June the 13th. Ah, that fits, doesn't it? Probably stayed the night, back on the 12th, straight to the bank on the 13th. Thank you, Dizelle. Thank you, Chief. Oh, uh, when is the funeral? Tomorrow morning. Mm. The inspector will have a number of us at the cemetery. That was certainly a quiet funeral, Gilles. The quietest. Yes, the lodgers, one neighbour, Francine, two reporters, and about 30 police in various parts of the cemetery. The sister. She looked very subdued. Something's happened to her. Walk on gently, Louise. I want a few words with the lady. All right. Don't be too long, though. Uh, Mademoiselle, my wife and I came to pay our respects. Thank you. I'm... I'm glad it's over. I'll leave this town this afternoon. So soon? 
What has happened, Francie? Nothing. I, I've just had enough. There'll be quite a deal of business to attend to still, won't there? Your sister died a wealthy woman, as you must know. Did she help you set up your hairdresses in La Rochelle, Francine? She came into some money years ago. She loaned me some. Mm. Her lover must have been a rich man. I believe he gave her that money. Fifteen years ago. The first payment of many, Francine. Perhaps she did have a lover. I don't know. Well, you said the other day there was never a man in her life. That child you had 15 years ago, where did you go to have it? Why do you want to know? Well, I'm not sure, Manzo. Where was it? Burgundy, a village called Mamille Le Mans. And your sister went with you? I told you, she was a good sister at that time. Why are you frightened, Manzo? You are, aren't you? Are you afraid of the man who killed your sister? I had a phone call this morning. He threatened me. So I'm going to clear out. If he wants to kill you, Francine, he'll not stop trying when you leave, is she, will he? You'll be just as good a target in La Rochelle, won't you? Uh, this lady is Madame Dubois, Chief. Uh, Madame Dubois, this is Chief Inspector Maigret. Oh, Monsieur. Madame Dubois is the switchboard operator at the Hotel de la Gare. Uh, Francine's hotel. Go on. Well, just by chance, she listened in to the call made to Francine Lange by a man this morning. Oh, I don't make a habit of listening to calls, Monsieur. Everybody believes we switchboard girls do, but we don't. Well, not all that often. Mostly we're too busy, and, and most calls are too boring to bother with. Ah, uh, yes, but this morning you did oh, because... I wasn't busy, and the man had an odd voice. And he was in a phone box, and he wasn't the boyfriend phoning from La Rochelle. Yeah, and the conversations with the boyfriend were interesting. Oh, they were hair-raising, monsieur. Uh, yes, but what did this man say, madame? He asked if she was Francine Lange. She said, yes, she was. He went straight on and said it was of the utmost importance that she should stay on in Vichy for a few days, in her own interest, and he would be in touch again. Then he finished by saying that there'd be a great deal of money in it for her. Mm, thank you, Madame Dubois. Tell me, did he have an educated voice? I mean, you said it was odd. Oh, the voice but... of an educated Parisian, monsieur. Odd, because it was wheezy. I had a friend once who was an asthmatic, and she used to wheeze just like that. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Well, that is invaluable, eh, Lika? Mm. And from a phone box, are you sure? Oh, yes, quite sure. The public telephones have a certain sound to them. And when he asked me if there was a Mademoiselle Lange staying in the hotel, he hadn't closed the box door. You could hear the traffic. Then he closed it. Yeah, I've had a number of other hotels checked on Chief. He phoned seven asking for our girl before he was lucky, and mm. they too were sure it was from a phone booth. You do know, monsieur, that Mademoiselle Lange left the hotel a few hours ago? Uh, yes, madame, we knew. She was in a hurry, Chief. I'm told that she changed from her funeral black, paid her bill, and drove off in that smart little car of hers all in half an hour. Mm, did she? So the offer of money if she stayed had the opposite effect. What was she frightened of? Eh? I, I, I may be speaking out of place, but surely the man who phoned could have been her sister's murderer. I'm sure he was, madam. <gasps> oh. But he doesn't intend to murder again. I don't think he intended to murder the first time. Now, he wants some information. Elaine Lange wouldn't give it to him. Perhaps Francine will. Only, whatever it is, she, like her sister, is in fear of having to give it. Do you follow me, Luca? Yes, I think so, Chief. I wish I did. What sort of information does a man want so badly he'll kill for it? He'll kill a woman for it. That is of the utmost importance, my lad. Luca, it's none of my business, but I think you should keep a watch on the phone boxes near the main hotels. You know what to look for, and he'll phone again. Now, I must have my last two glasses of the waters. Thank you, madame. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Oh. You're looking round you as if you expect the lady in life to reappear. It makes me shiver. No, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what I'm looking for. I swear this water tastes more bitter this evening. Um, it's the mood you're in. He must have an overriding obsession. But for 15 years, he never meant to kill her. Only to get her to tell him the truth. Or did he discover something so monstrous, so unforeseen that... I think you're actually sorry for her. Well, his world has collapsed, as they say. Already he's reduced to escaping his wife so he can make phone calls from boxes. Hello. 
Here's somebody leaving the hotel. Big chap. Expensive suit. In a hurry. Heading straight for the phone box across the road. Better radio in. Dussel here. Suspect in phone box in the Rue de Gaulle. Watching. Damn it, I think he's spotted me. Out of the phone box, going south towards Chomel Park. Not hurrying anymore. What's he up to? You think he's with his wife? Well, he can't phone from his hotel. How did he get away the night he visited Elaine? What was out of the opera house, you know? I think it was Tosca. Women like Tosca, I'm told, more so than men. Mm, you could be right. What sort of a man could love Elaine along? Jim, there's a man hmm? over there, standing watching us. Yes, ah, so I see. The person I was looking out for, Louise, without realizing. Good evening, monsieur. Can I help you? Good evening, Monsieur Maigret. Madame Maigret. Monsieur. I am Louis Pellardot. Do you mind if I sit? No, please, Monsieur Pellado. As you can hear, I'm sure I, I suffer from asthma. And, and, and I was hurrying earlier, but then I, I gave the policeman following me time to catch up. It's that young sergeant, Gilles. Dissel, isn't it? Yeah, over there, isn't she? Mm. He won't interfere unless I call him. Well, Monsieur, you have something to tell me. I hoped you'd be here. I have seen you in here in the evening, I, as I also saw Elaine Lange here one evening. We called her the Lady in Lilac. Good name for her. I hadn't seen her for 15 years. I had no idea she lived here, and this is my first visit, so you see it was all fortuitous. Now, I must warn you, Monsieur Pallado, whatever you say could be used in evidence. Yes, yes, I know. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it all again to the local police, but I must speak to you first. You see, there's something I need to know. You're a clever man. You may well know the one thing. So be it. Elaine Lange was your mistress? Once, for some years. She worked for my firm. I've been married for 30 years. I, I was 40 when I met Elaine. It wasn't very a passionate affair, but I think I loved her. And did she love you, monsieur? There was only a glimmer of warmth in Elaine's nature, not enough for love. Although I believe that she would love our child well enough. Perhaps you knew she had a child 15 years ago. She said she went to Burgundy to Maine Le Mans to have it? Correct. It was a son, Philippe. She sent me a copy of the birth certificate and said that she wanted never to see me again. I understood. She said she would devote her life to bringing the child up if I would support her and him. But I must not see him until he was of age. So she would disappear and she would let me know where to send the money. She reckoned, correctly, if I knew where she was, I wouldn't have the willpower not to try to see her. I'm rich. I gave her the money to buy a house. I gave her money also for her younger sister's education in a Swiss convent. Elaine was devoted to the upbringing of this sister. Mm. If you'd met Francine Lange as you wanted to, you'd have found her an unusual product of such an education. Sir, so, that was a lie also. I knew nothing about my son. She only ever wrote to tell me where to send the money each month. I saw her in this park. I wasn't sure it was her at first, but the second time, yes. I followed her back to her house. She never noticed me. I don't think she noticed anybody. I had to see her. That Monday, my wife went to the opera, the Tosca. I wheeze louder than the singer, so I don't visit the opera. Mm. I found Elaine in this park. I followed her back, introduced myself. I don't think she recognized me. I forced my way in and asked her about the boy. She was very calm. She told me many things about him. I asked to see a photograph. She refused. I suddenly ceased 
to believe her. That room. There wasn't a sign of anybody in it. Ever. But it ain't. I asked to know where the boy was. She sat there and said nothing. I opened her desk, some drawers, nothing. There wasn't a single thing. Letter, photo, school report, document. I took her by the throat to make her tell me the truth. I used too much strength. If only she'd shown a spark of feeling. Afterwards, I ransacked the other rooms. Nothing. Nothing. Was there ever a child? Is he long dead? Or, or an imbecile? I still wanted to know. So I tried the younger sister. And then I realized I was being watched. Mm, I'll tell you, monsieur, what I believe to be true. You never had a son. What? Francine gave birth to a son at Maine Le Mans. She had it fostered, and it drowned when it was two. Elaine registered it as hers. From then on, both sisters sat back and let you pay. Elaine's plan, I suspect. Practical and simple. Monstrous. Monstrous. For 15 years, I believed I had a son. He was quite right. It was monstrous. Ah, here's Louise. Mm -hmm. Come to see that we're drinking our midst. Have you both finished? Jules? Georges? <laughs> no, sit down, my dear. I haven't finished my drink or my story quite. Which story, Jules? Ah, when I last came here to take a water. Huh? That? Those two terrible women. That poor man believing he had a son. It was in this park, wasn't it, Jules? Yes, just over there. He told us his story while the cur and his chaps gathered to take him away. What happened to him? Well, he employed a good lawyer and the best advocate in France. He pleaded guilty to manslaughter with mitigating circumstances. His story was such they acquitted him. For once, I was glad to see a man who had killed walk free. They took him for a ride, did those two? Everything came out in the court about Francine. The money for her education. How Hélène claimed they were orphans. Francine's child. Pelado. That was his name. Mm. A good man of business, but a complete sucker otherwise. And to take up with such a woman. Mm. And to come to Vichy to take the waters. At least it didn't rain each day. <laughs> but it did me good. Busman's holiday, though it was. <laughs> In Maigret Takes the Waters by Georges Simenon, translated by Eileen Ellenbogen and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham and Simenon by Michael Goff. Louise Maigret, Irene Sutcliffe, Inspector Lecoeur, Rod Beecham, Sergeant Dissel, Malcolm Edwards, Louis Pellardo, Richard Caldicott, Francine Lange, Diana Eden, and Madame Dubois, Shirley Dixon. The play was produced and directed by Christopher Venning. <laughs>